Hello, my friends, and welcome back. Welcome back to another session with the older man. Hey, today I have literally one of the best pieces I'm going to bring you. You're going to love me for this. And who's going to love me for this? Anyone who's married, anyone who's considering getting married, anyone who's having trouble in your relationships, I want you to listen to this one guy. Although I have to tell you, one of the most depressing divorces I ever did was a guy who was, I think, 92. Oh, geez. And the, what made it depressing is that he had left his wife of, I don't know, 50-something, 60-something years for a younger woman, a woman in her 50s. And I just remember what was sad about it to me was this guy is still being led around by his dick. Now, this is a divorce attorney. And I'm, I've, I've seen this on a few other male channels. And I really, really think that this man needs a Pulitzer Prize for producing this piece. Because as an older man who's been through two divorces, I wish I had met this guy early in my life. Guys, you don't understand how invaluable these male channels are now becoming because here here in these channels you now get to understand number one female nature and number two because now you can get a much deeper understanding on the things that are important for you in life whether it's finances relationships because we know relationships are number one because is that relationships and money are closely tied because we know as men, if you don't have the money, nah, your chances of having a relationship is slim to none. It's as simple as that and tied together. This divorce attorney, Mr. James Sexton, he's a New York attorney, I think. And this interview is done by Mr. Mark Latio. Now, I might be butchering your name, sir. Please excuse me if I am, but I want to give you and this gentleman, my deepest regards, because I'm telling you, you guys did an amazing interview. And guys, for you watching, this is done on his channel. The channel is called The Soft White Underbelly. I'm going to put a link here so that you guys can go there and listen to this interview. But of course, listen, before we go forward, please give me a thumbs up. Guys, I'm bringing you some serious knowledge here. This is going to probably be one of the best pieces of education I'm bringing you right now on this channel. Listen, grab a cup of coffee, put on your headphones if you're in the office, just listen in the background at the gym. But please, ladies, gentlemen, everybody, listen to this guy, okay? It's, a, it's going to be around half an hour, 45 minutes, but it is worth it. I can guarantee you. And if you want to listen to the full over one hour video, you can of course go to his website. I will put a link in the description section so you guys can go and listen as well. All right. So if you haven't been here before, listen, subscribe, subscribe to the channel. If you guys want to contribute anything to the channel, super tanks is always great below. I'm on my way to getting that super computer so I can start editing and getting you some more videos much faster. Okay. So without further ado, Let's get into this video. I'm going to try my hardest not to interject too many times, but I still have my two cents to put in every once in a while. All right. So let's listen to it. Well, when you're in your 20s or 30s, maybe yeah. you, your, your libido is a strong. No, it's, yeah. It makes you insane. Yeah. Yeah. I was not. I definitely was. As we age, we mellow. Yeah. Which I think is great. Although I have to tell you, one of the most depressing divorces I ever did was a guy who was, I think, 92. Oh, geez. And the, what made it depressing is that he had left his wife of, I don't know, 50-something, 60-something years for a younger woman, a woman in her 50s. And I just remember what was sad about it to me was this guy is still being led around by his dick. Like, I thought, oh, my God. Like, I'm going to be chained to an idiot forever. Like, I'm going to forever be led around by my dick. And I remember thinking, like, no, I really thought that at, like, 90-something... I would just, like a w beautiful woman would walk by and i go, oh, there's a human being. Like there would be no... You could appreciate it without... Any yeah, there would just be no sense of like, yeah, you know, there would just, that would be gone from me. And this guy's proof that 90 something years old and you're still thinking with your dick. Like I... We're doomed. I, that terrified me. It really did. It actually upset me because I thought, man, I thought at some point I'd get to experience what it's like. 
to just be what, free. You, from you live in New York, where there's there's a financial industry. There's, oh, yeah. there's there's all kinds of industries here. Oh yeah. But to me, sometimes I, I wonder if female attractiveness isn't the mo the highest valued commodity in our hundred percent. It is. I listened to this this morning with my wife. She rarely listens to my content. So I know something is good when I listen with my wife and she actually listened to it right the way through and she, there wasn't a lot of comments. However, with this one, I noticed the eye rolling and the smile because, listen, we men know, especially as we get older, if you take care of your body, if you take care of everything that makes you function physically, your libido and your sex drive literally will last right up into your late 70s, 80s, and 90s. Now, I wouldn't go as far as divorcing my wife at 92 years old. Hey, that's the reality of life. So I asked my wife, why do you think that he divorced his wife at that age? Uh, she couldn't come up with any other reason because women don't think like men. And I said, I can tell you exactly why. This man evaluated, listen, I haven't gotten any sex in the last 20 years, at least. I'm sure his wife probably just said, I'm so tired of this old dick. And her sex drive has died off. And she literally was not giving him any sex for the last probably 10, 15, 20 years. This man said to himself, I'm 92, I don't have much time left. I've accumulated this amount of money. I'm gonna marry a woman 30 years younger than me. I'm gonna hit it as long as I can. I'm gonna die happy. That's how men think. That's it. Don't care how much society tries to change that. That's how we're wired. Anyway, let's proceed. Uh, yeah, of course. Because you know, men, men are becoming youth. rich and powerful in order to get a woman. Of course. The woman they want. Of course. The, what, a, what an attractive woman. And when I say attractive, I don't just mean attractive. I, I mean even just sexually confident. I mean, what an unbelievably lucrative career that is. Like I do divorces for people that, you know, a woman walks out with two, three hundred million dollars. He was an analyst at Goldman Sachs who built a hedge fund and then sold it and then used his trading algorithm to build it up to five hundred million dollars. She was hot <laughs> and slept with him for a while and then stopped and started sleeping with other people and playing tennis and having Botox and she's going to get half. No like, that's divorce. That's fucking incredible. Like, you know what he had to do to get that? And what she had to, I'll fuck that guy for $200 million. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Like, that's insane. That's incredible. Like, and what, and God bless. I mean, I'm not saying that this person, this is the rules of the game, you know, but you can't argue that that's not easier than going to Harvard. No, for sure. But then, know? but then the payoff, the, the trade off for that is, that when they hit a certain age, the, well, the value decreases. Right, right. I would love if I had an attorney like this all the time, just talking to me as candid and as open like this about life. You know, none of the legalese conversation. Just talk to me like a man. Tell me what the problems are, where I'm, I should not mess up. This is why this piece is so powerful because this attorney rolled his sleeves up and he's telling you like it is. This man could be an amazing therapist. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. Play any stock if you hold it too long, it's <laughs> yeah. going to go down. You know, like so. Play play the stock the right way. I mean, and that's what I think. Uh, if we were a little more honest about the nature of male female coupling, I mean, right now we can't even you know we can't even establish what is gender, you know, we can't establish any of that anymore. So, so divorce is becoming incredibly hilarious and fraught. Because well, to, to me, what, what, what is like, sometimes you have to stand back and look at things to, to get the real perspective on what it is. Sure. And sometimes you look back at marriage. <clears throat> so when was it invented? Like 2000 BC, roughly. And the life expectancy of humans back then was 18 yeah. years old. Yeah. And yeah. marriage was created for, um, land ownership, land ownership, and things like that. Yeah. And if you're going to die in your early 20s or whatever, then then getting married at, at 16, 18 makes sense. Well, I think there's a distinction that has to be made between pair bonds and marriage. Right? Marriage is a is a is a government concept. Marriage is a contract. Marriage is a legal status. And this is one of the biggest issues a lot of people have a problem with. 
I did one of my earlier videos that had very little views about this one simple point, explaining to people that there's a very, very distinct difference between marriage and love. You don't get into a marriage and expect that love is the primary thing that's going to keep your marriage together. Marriage is a contract. It's a cold, nasty contract. The shitty thing is it does not have an expiry date. And you need to ask yourself, which contract would you get involved with if it doesn't have an expiry date? None. The answer should be none because there's no other contract that exists that don't have an expiry date. Contracts between countries have a 100, 200 year expiry date. But for some reason, there's no expiry dates on marriage. That's why you should go and watch my video on, re, on my redefining of marriage. Now, redefining of peer bond, you know, redefining of marriage. The marriage laws that, as we have it is antiquated and should be reformed completely to fit both parties. Let's proceed. Two people go in it together. You know, saying, hey, there's 7.3 billion people in the world and the two of us, we're going we're gonna to lock up together and we're going to try to hold hands and get through this thing. Until we're know? 80 years old. Well, until whatever, you know. I mean, what's interesting is, first of all, all marriages end. They end in death or divorce, but they all end. Like every marriage ends. So it's one of the only things that you go, wow, I really hope this ends in us dying. You know, most things, you, you, that's not the desired outcome. But in marriage, you hope marriage will end in death. You hope that you will be together until one or both of you die, you know, but all marriages end. But so as, as, as a guy, as a provider, if you knew it was going to end and you were going to have to give away half your money, you, you might think twice about doing it. Well, I think that's what makes being a divorce lawyer interesting is that it's, it's a lot of what a court has to do is disregard what happened in the marriage because A, the truth is at the bottom of a bottomless pit. Like, you're never going to get there. Yeah, well, I was, he's fucking his secretary. Right, because you were not sleeping with me anymore. I have a client whose wife acknowledges she didn't sleep with him for six years. What, what did you think was going on if you didn't sleep with him for six years? So, you, okay, delegate. You've delegated that responsibility. If you don't want to have sex with him, that's okay. No one should force you to have sex with this person. Let him go have sex with someone else. You don't want to do the laundry, hire someone to do the laundry. If you don't want to mow your own lawn, hire someone to mow the lawn. Delegate that responsibility. And this guy wasn't even sleeping around. He was going to those hand job places, you know, where you get a massage and you get a hand. Like, what the most pathetic thing in the world, the most innocuous thing in the world. He didn't have a girlfriend. There was no love involved. He was getting jacked off for $50. Like, that's sad. Like, I mean, first of all, hand jobs, like, that's an outdated technology. That's like a Betamax. You know, like, who even does that anymore? But he, he was doing this and he just thought, okay, that's fine. She had the indignation to say he is not a, he shouldn't be a custodial parent. He's a terrible person because he's doing this. And it was like, wait, how is that that much different than going to a strip club? How is that much more different? Because we just, you know, he was like, well, should I deny it? And I was like, is it true? And he's like, well, yeah. I said, no, we should own it. Let's go in and say, yeah, you know what? Yeah, it's pathetic. It's really pathetic. My wife didn't sleep with me for six years and I'm human. And I wanted to have sex still. I didn't want to blow up my life. I didn't want to screw up my kids and have my kids have divorced parents. So I thought, all right, she's clearly not interested in me anymore. I'm not going to have a girlfriend and get caught up in all the things where people could get hurt and there's feelings and fatal attraction and stuff. I'm just going to go. It'll be transactional, like going to a strip club. You know, you guys have no idea how many sexless marriages there are in this world. This is a serious issue. So many times women cut off men from having sex with them. It affects them in so many different ways that we don't even realize it when we're in it, right? And it does affect them. We think that it doesn't, but it really does. And let me define what a sexless marriage is according to um, the standards of, a, of, of being a sexologist, right? I, I get asked that a lot. What is defined as a sexless marriage? A sexless marriage is defined as having less, 10 or less, you're in a sexless marriage, to be honest with you. And let me just tell you that 15 to 20% of American marriages are in a sexless marriage, which breaks my heart. Women's libido and male libido are two totally different things. Now, granted, I have seen women whose men no longer want to have sex with them. So I've seen it on both sides. But the large majority of the time, 
the woman is the one who cuts off the sex to the man. Usually, it occurs after she has her first or second kid. So when she's already had her kids and she's, it's almost like being satisfied, her sex drive isn't as high. Her body isn't producing that sort of urgency to have sex, even for pleasure. And that's where it suffers. And if she leaves it long enough, it tends to die even more. You got to understand that concept. Use it or lose it. Simple. So women tend to not have a lot of sex with the men. And then these men are left high and dry, forcing them to go outside to get their needs met because men are biologically designed to have sex with multiple women. And if they're not getting it from one, the urge, the, the, the hunger becomes even worse. The frustration, he even have prostate issues if he don't have sex. So you got to understand the urgency for men to have sex is much greater than women. But then they will condemn the man when he goes outside and get his needs met. This is where the problem comes in. Action and stuff. I'm just going to go. It'll be transactional, like going to a strip club or anything else. And I mean, yeah, is it a little pathetic that I'm a guy who makes a million dollars a year in finance and I'm paying someone $50 to jack me off? Yeah, that's kind of pathetic. But you know what? I figured out. But to suggest that that means making a million dollars a year. Yeah, he's trying to protect his ass because you might say that this guy's pathetic, right? But this guy's smart. This, if this guy's making a million dollars and he goes out, he messes up with one woman who gets one of his seeds, he's screwed. Now he has some woman on the side who's looking for child support from a millionaire. Oh gosh. So now she gets to, to grab into his purse. So the man is actually smart. It is pathetic, but he's smart. He's playing the safe game. Just go to some Thai massage, get a good happy ending after a little massage, costs you $10, $15, you're good to go. <laughs> it is pathetic, but it's smart. I'm a bad parent. That has nothing to do with my parenting at all, period. You know, so, and thankfully the judge agreed with me on that one. But I, I really do think that, that the idea I don't think, I mean, if you break it down fundamentally, 56% of marriages end in divorce. Like, think about, that's the ones that end in divorce. So, how many people, what percentage stay together for the kids? Or because they don't want to give away half their shit. Another 10%? That's conservative. Conservative. But let's say, let's say 20% then, okay? That's, that's at least right. You now have a technology that fails 76% of the time. That's insane. That's insane. That's more likely than not. 76%. If I told you there's a 76% chance when you walk out the door today, you're going to get hit in the head with a bowling ball, you would not go out or you'd wear a helmet for sure. But people just continue to get married. Not only do they continue to get married, there's a presumption that you should get married. And if you don't get married, there's something wrong with you. So if you've got a girlfriend and you've been with her for five years and you say to someone, we're getting married, they go, oh, that's great. You know, they don't go, why? You're happy. Why would you get married? Like, everything's going fine. Why would you put yourself through that? Why would you run that risk? If you say to someone, we've been together five years, and we've decided we're not going to get married. We're going to move in together, but we're not going to get married. Ooh, what's wrong? You have intimacy issues? What's your problem? Meanwhile, 56% end in divorce. It's, it's literally fits the legal definition of negligence. It's a negligent behavior. The way you define negligence in law school is when what you lose by not doing something, okay, is lower than the risk of harm. It's what's called a BPL analysis. So the burden of not doing a thing is lower than the likelihood, the probability of harm. So BPL, so burden, probability, and loss. Marriage is an inherently negligent activity. It's like owning a lion. Like it, 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 you're, the likelihood of... And this is a divorce attorney warning you. And as a married man, I listen to this and I'm the guy that will still get married. Happily married. So we do have an inherent desire to pair bond. I mean, that is just who we are as a species. We want to pair bond with another person, but we have to understand marriage and pair bonding are two separate things. Disney, is the one that combined these things 
and made us stupid. The fairy tale is what made us stupid. This is the biggest problem. Marriage and love are two totally different things. Let's continue. Someone getting hurt seriously no by this is very, this. very high. No one ever says it to you because why? Because, and, and I'm, I would say something, I've been doing this for over 20 years and I, I still get misty eyed at weddings. Like I still really, there's something in me that goes like, you know, maybe it'll work out for these two. You still believe like, it's in love. Sweet. I absolutely believe in love. I think love is wonderful. The, but love and marriage have very little to do with each other. I don't think there's much of a correlation there. I, I, and I think that's where we got off track. Like, I believe in pair bonds. I believe, I don't think I can learn everything I need to know about myself from myself. I, I think having someone around me who sees my blind spots, and that, that doesn't have to be a romantic partner. That could be a friend. That could be any number of things. But there is something wonderful about romantic connection. We know that. I mean, the other statistic is 56% of marriages end in divorce, but 84% of people who get divorced are remarried within five years of their divorce. Really? Think about that. So now you've, <laughs> now you've done it and failed and felt the pain of the loss. And within five years, 84% are remarried. So when, when you fall in love and you, you're, you're with a partner who is in love with you, sure. it's, just, it's like hard to put the brakes on and say, you know what? That's as far as I'm going to go. Well, I think we, you know, whoever discovered water, it wasn't a fish. And I think when we're in a thing, we don't see it. And so... I mean, and, and this is true no, of any of us. There must be like, some endorphins, some, some, something's yeah, being released I in think our brains. It's a piece, it? Listen, you, you want to test that theory. The next time you're out with a couple who've been together for a while and it like seems like they maybe got in a fight or they're just like kind of being, you know, impatient with each other at the table, you know, when you go like a group thing, just say to them, so tell me about how you met. Tell me, tell me the story of how you met and everything on them changes. At, like they go back to that place. And there's this like, oh yeah, and she was this. Because for that second, you go back to that place. Like you can go, someone with a horrible divorce, if you could get them to go to that place and talk to you about that time. Like I, I would tell you something, when I was a kid, you know, like every kid, you have the fantasy of like, if you were invisible, what would you do? You didn't go to the girl's locker room, you know, whatever. I, I have this fantasy that if I could be invisible, I, I have about eight clients that I'd like to sneak into their house and find their wedding album. Like, I know it's in the attic somewhere or something. Because I would love to see what it looked like when these people loved each other. Because they are weaponized against each other now. And we are trying to kill each other. And we're taking every secret, every intimacy, you, you, you everything. See, and we're just... At, we're, their, at their ugliest. At their ugliest, at their worst. And there's something in me that just the thought that, like, you guys at some point, like... At some point, you were like, there's 7.3 billion people in the world, and you're the one. You know, I watched the Johnny Depp Amber Heard special that's now showing on Netflix, and they were talking about how they met. And part of the documentary showed when they first met and, and how loving they were and, and how amazing things were. And for a second, you get caught up in the fact that, hey, man, this just felt good. And then... You see the switch, and you look in the, and you look at both of them in court, just trying to destroy each other. You you watch the whole process in the court case, and you realize, man, these people just want to kill each other. How the hell did it get from, oh my God, you're the best thing in my life, to I want to destroy you? It's mind blowing how couples can actually go from absolute love absolute disdain and hatred for each other to the point where they will do whatever it takes to destroy the next person's life. It blows my mind, but that's the nature of relationships. Like you're the one I just want to be with and smell and touch and like that, 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 that feeling, we all know that feeling of like just the electricity of another person, you know? And, and I, I mean, I, you know, I, I think I'm a romantic at heart in the sense that I really get it. Like, I really get why we do this. I, I felt it. I know it. I understand it. But tying that to the technology of marriage to me makes almost no sense whatsoever. And I actually think it's almost antagonistic to that connection with another person because there's so much expectation that comes with marriage culturally. We've created 
so much stuff around it. Like when you, when you marry someone, they're supposed to be, at least in the modern Western model, your best friend, best roommate, best co-parent, best travel partner, best uh, roommate, best everything, best activity partner. Like how, how would one person be all of those things? That's insane. Like if, if I, if I was interviewing for a job and said, I want you to be the best typist and I also want you to be best on the phone and I also want you to be great at that. And I ran down a list of dissimilar things. Like, or if I went to an amazing chef and I said, I know you're a great chef, but can you farm? Like, well, those, that has to do with food, but they're not the same thing. Like, what are you talking? So I think why, why do we put on people this idea? Like whoever came up with the word soulmate? really we should be paying, like divorce lawyers should be paying that person dividends. Because we've convinced people that if this person isn't meeting every one of your needs, checking all of these boxes, they're not your soulmate. And I see this shit happen so often with couples where the woman will complain about, he don't do this, 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 and this, and this. And I ask them, well, is he paying the bills? Has he hit you? Has he done? Does he do this, this, and this? Yeah, he does all of that. No, he's a good husband, but he don't do this. How many times do you ever hear a woman say, oh, he's a good husband, but this is what he's talking about. So many women out here, and you see it every day online. Oh, he was a good husband. Oh, he was a good man, but how can those two things come together and be valid? You are either good or you're bad. There is no but in between because everybody expects one person to be perfect. And this is not men doing this shit. We know it's the woman. The woman's list of the requirements from a man, what he has to be, is this long. My marriage failed in my 20s and I wanna give y'all some advice if you've never been married before. My marriage failed for a lot of reasons, but I think this is my biggest downfall. I never thought through what kind of husband I wanted, which probably sounds dumb, but I literally just, I didn't think it through. And now that I'm divorced, I have a list of like the traits I want my future husband to have. I spelled it all out cause I'm not settling. I'm gonna share with y'all what I wrote so that you can go make your own list. Cause even if you got a great boyfriend, you need to think these things through. I was dating my ex for three years before we got married. I just never, I never made a list. I loved him and that was enough for me. Stupid, you need a list. This list isn't what you want them to look like or anything like that. It's the traits you want them to have, like what type of person you want them to be. All right, things I want a husband. Loves the outdoors, cuddles in the morning, good hygiene, warm, happy personality, no mental health problems or correctly medicated, surprises me slash does cute things, plans dates, bachelor's degree or higher, which my boyfriend doesn't have that, but he has a great career, so that one's kind of superficial anyways. Good job, nice vehicle, that one's superficial too, and my boyfriend's vehicle is a junker, but it made me appreciate my car now. Anyways, manly man, spiritual leader, lives an active, healthy life, can do projects, very sexy world, puts me in my place, I got that one underlined too, never calls me mean words, likes to dance, good with money, enjoys creating social media content with me, motivates me to be my best self. Men only want three things, sex, sandwich, silence. That's it, done. No more than that. It's impossible for one man, or I'm gonna just so that you, the woman don't get triggered, or one woman to be everything to you. Take your pick and enjoy what that person can offer. I did a, a video around six months ago and I said, I don't go to the gym with my wife. My wife goes to a totally different gym from I do. Why? I can't work out with my wife. I don't do certain things with my wife. She does that on her own, that's her thing. I got a few comments about, oh, that's how you lose your relationship when you don't do things with your wife. I didn't say I don't do every, I don't do nothing, but there's just certain things that will only bring problems with us. My gym time is my peace time. I don't want to have to go and train her or if I say something about her, her exercise technique, it's going to bring problems. I don't need that when I'm trying to take care of myself as well. So we don't work well in that situation. So we don't, we don't do it together. She's fine doing her thing over there and I'm fine doing my thing at another gym. It's simple. There's always a solution to get along while we're, while we're married and being good partners to each other. But you can't expect everything. You, your, your soulmate would know exactly what to do, exactly what to say at exactly the right time. Hmm. Disney fairy tale. I can get, I can go off on this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Tend to, well, I mean, uh, what, what do you think the secret is to keeping a, a marriage vital, keeping it alive? You know, I think, I think 
people people get unhappy in marriages the way that people go bankrupt, which is very slowly and then all at once. I think it's very slow and then it just goes off a cliff. So everybody will say, well, we divorced because he was cheating or she was cheating or we divorced because he had an alcohol issue or a drug issue, which lately we're seeing more like alcohol and drugs is, is a big, big thing, especially post pandemic. There's a tremendous amount of substance abuse stuff that's causing a lot of issues in marriages. And certainly like social media has increased the accessibility of adultery and connections to other people and reconnections with people from your past who remind you of a version of yourself that you felt more excited about because you were younger. So it's, you know, it used to be if you like ran into the girl you banged in high school, it was like once every 10 years at a reunion, you know, or if you lived in the same town as you grew up in, you know, you might run into the person at the Walmart. But now it's like on Facebook, you have all these excuses to be able to chit chat with someone and all these benign entry points, you know, of like, oh, you know, I saw your pictures from vacation. Where did you stay in Miami? You know, and and then it becomes, oh, yeah, well, you looked great. I mean, boy, you look fantastic in a bikini. And then all of a sudden we're off to the races and we're chatting with each other. So I, I you know, if we were going to invent like an infidelity machine, you couldn't do better than Facebook and Instagram. I mean, that's about as good as it gets. But I, I, I genuinely think that the secret to staying happy in a marriage is probably the, the same secret to maintaining a healthy weight. You know, don't wait till you get super fat and then try to lose the weight. Don't wait until you get really sick. Like my sister is a dentist. And she always says, if you have a toothache, there's nothing I can do really. Like I can pull the tooth, I can give you a root canal, but like... I can prevent you from getting a toothache if you just come see me regularly and you just floss and you just brush your teeth. You'll never get a toothache. By the time your tooth hurts, something is already seriously wrong. By the time you're in a divorce lawyer's office, you're fucked. The whole thing's fucked at that point. Like you'd be better off just, you know, figuring out the preventative maintenance, right? Like change the oil in your car. Like, so I, what I try to, if you reverse engineer divorce, like most people, the marriage killer, you know, the, like the cheating or the gambling or the whatever, that's the symptom. Like the, 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 the problem is these little disconnections, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the best stories I, I have is my, I had a client who I, I did her divorce and we'd spend a lot of time together because you do, you know, when you're a divorce lawyer, you spend a lot of time with people and you get to know them very well. I mean, people will lie to their therapist that they won't lie to their divorce lawyer because A, there's no reason to, and B, they, you know, I need to know everything and, and it's all attorney client privilege. And this woman, we were sitting uh, outside the courtroom waiting on a break in testimony. And she was a young woman in her, in her probably like late thirties, you know, very attractive. And we were just chit chatting. And I said to her, you know, was there a moment when you realized the marriage is over? You know, like, was there a moment? And she said, yeah, yeah. And I said, when, when was it? And she said, I, there was this granola that I like. She said, it, I, I, they only sold it at like this particular grocery store. And I like to put it in my yogurt. And she said, he used to always, whenever I'd be running low on it, I would just open the thing one day and a, a new bag would be there. She's like, and I, I just, she's like, it made me feel so loved. Like he didn't, I didn't have to ask. He didn't want credit for it. Like he didn't go like, oh, did you see? I got your granola that you wanted, you know? Like he just would do this thing, you know? And she said it was just something that like, I just, it always made me smile. She said every time the granola was running low and there was a new bag of granola, I just felt very loved, you know? And she said one day the granola ran out. And I thought, oh, that's weird. You know, maybe, maybe he didn't see it. She's like, so I left the bag in there because I thought, well, at some point he'll notice. And he didn't notice. She goes, so I took the bag out and I waited and he didn't get a new bag. And I thought, okay, this thing's going down. And I thought to myself, wow, that's like, you know, that's such a small thing, like granola, like you just, but, but these are the things, like these are the little things that make us feel loved and that are gestures of love. And when I said to her, was there anything like that for you with him? And she said, yeah, blowjobs. Mm. And I almost spit out my coffee. And she goes, no, she goes, when we were first dating and even first married, she's like, I used to give him blowjobs a lot. She's like, you know, she's like, 
I do it in the morning, took two minutes, and he was like super happy the rest of the day, you know? She's like, the rest of the day, he would like call me or text me and be like, oh, that was so good this morning, you know? I had such pep in my step now. And she's like, it was just like, what did it really take out of my life to do that, you know? And it made him feel good. She's like, and then I got to a point where I was like, well, you know what? No, I'll wait. And then tonight we can both, ha we can have sex and we'll both enjoy that. Like, what is, do I owe him a blowjob? Like, no, you know, like I don't owe him that, you know? And, and, and then she said, I got to a point where it was like, I look back and I'm like, yeah, I guess I, I didn't do that as often, hardly ever really, which you know, came, which came first. You know, I said that to her and she said, I, I, she said, I couldn't tell you. She said, but I think it's the same thing. It's the same thing. And I do think it's the same thing. Yeah. And I'm not saying blowjobs and granola is all you need to know, but, <laughs> and I'm not, by the way, I'm not saying that, that a blowjob is a small thing. I don't think I have any right to. I've never given one, but it seems like a phenomenal feat. And I, I, I'm grateful for everyone I've ever received, but I don't, I, I don't think it's a massive investment. Right? Just like buying someone's granola is not but, a mess. But, but, Just when, like, but when you love somebody, you love doing things for them. Right. Their pleasure you, you, you pleases love making you. Their, life better. their joy pleases you. Like their their you know, their happiness makes you happy. And I'm gonna leave it right there. Listen, guys, I know you enjoyed that. Go to these guys' YouTube channel, watch the rest of this video. They deserve it because this guy hit it out the park without a doubt all right let me know what you guys think let's have a discussion on this and of course subscribe and hit the notification button and you know i have to leave you that one last phrase whenever in doubt always ask an older man all right see you in the next one cheers